Uh, hello and welcome to our second lecture uh, in this class in biological psychology or behavioral neuroscience. And um, the lecture today is uh, one that I call, Is Behavioral Neuroscience Necessary? And I think one thing that a student should do in any course that they take is to um, ask that question uh, to the professor uh, of the course that they're taking and say, why do you think that this course is so important? Why do you think that this course is so essential uh, for, for me to be taking? And I think that uh, what most professors would do in that situation is um, is sit down um, and explain to you why they consider their particular field, their specialty, be, to be so important. And I think students um, deserve uh, to have that kind of information. They deserve uh, to be able to um, uh, you know, listen to a professor articulate why they consider their field to be uh, so important. So that's what I'm going to be doing over the course of of, the, um, of this lecture uh, today uh, is to really justify to you uh, why I consider uh, the field of behavioral neuroscience to be uh, so so important uh, in our world today. Uh, so um, again, is behavioral neuroscience necessary? And I, what I want to do is I want to run through uh, a few situations, um, interesting experiments that have been done and findings in the field of uh, behavioral neuroscience. And again, to articulate uh, to you why I consider this field to be <clears throat> very important. So um, many of you may have heard of the hormone uh, melatonin. Uh, that is secreted from the uh, pineal gland. And again, here uh, in this diagram, you see um, the um, uh, what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that you see right here. And here's the pineal gland uh, right down here. Um, that pineal gland is uh, light sensitive. Uh, and one of the things that we know is that uh, the amount of light that's in the environment is involved in how much of this hormone melatonin is being secreted uh, from uh, the, the pineal gland. Um, <clears throat> the pineal gland and the secretion of melatonin is very important for regulating our internal biological clock. Uh, and there are certain sleep disorders, for example, that uh, um, we now have treatments for uh, that involve um, injections uh, of, of melatonin. Uh, in particular, uh, individuals um, that frequently have to cross um, uh, different time zones uh, in the world, like pilots, for example, uh, can oftentimes experience uh, problems in terms of the regulation of their sleep. And one of the things that we know is that melatonin can uh, be involved uh, in that um, uh, regulation in terms of bringing an individual back to the, the kind of um, uh, sleep pattern that, uh, that they should be in so that they, they in fact are getting enough sleep. So again, certain types of sleep disorders then, uh, a major treatment that we now have is um, uh, the hormone melatonin. I'm not sure how many of you were aware uh, of that, but that is work that has really been very important work that's been done by behavioral neuroscientists. Uh, here's uh, another uh, very interesting uh, piece of research uh, that has been done um, uh, in which they, uh, one of the things that we're learning uh, is that the brain of the female changes dramatically uh, over the course of uh, pregnancy and then caring for our offspring. Uh, this is something that um, many scientists now have referred to as the, the mommy brain uh, phenomena. Uh, we know that the preoptic area of the hypothalamus and the hippocampus, uh, and here, here are some brain slices that we see here of a female uh, rat that has gone uh, through pregnancy and you see uh, dramatic changes that take place 
in the cells here in terms of a elaboration uh, of those cells. Again, much different from what you see in a, in a female rat that has not gone through uh, those kinds of changes uh, in terms of pregnancy. We know that these are hormone dependent changes. We'll be talking about this a little bit later on when we get to the area of reproductive behavior, but uh, there's speculation <clears throat> that um, uh, understanding these brain changes may be important for understanding um, behavioral changes that occur um, uh, both in lower animals <clears throat> and in human beings as a consequence of uh, 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 an animal going through uh, these, these reproductive changes. Indeed, in some cases, there's interesting research suggesting that um, uh, the uh, the, the kind of um, deficits that you see in some uh, human females uh, in terms of caring for their uh, uh, offspring uh, and things like postpartum depression, for example, uh, may be uh, related uh, to some of these brain changes that perhaps are not taking place as well in, in certain uh, uh, females that uh, go through these reproductive states. So it's a very interesting area of research. So my conclusion then is that, you know, this work by behavioral neuroscientists is very important. It's important for understanding what may be happening over the course uh, of, uh, of pregnancy uh, and may be reflected in these important uh, behavioral changes uh, that occur. Another area is um, work that has been done um, examining uh, this area of the brain that we see here, uh, the hippocampus. You can see the hippocampus flashing, um, and um, that's uh, a part of the brain that we now know is involved in uh, learning and memory. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of uh, research, uh, basic research that's been done uh, exploring what happens when, for example, this part of the brain uh, is removed uh, or this part of the brain maybe is there, there's some damage uh, to it. Uh, so uh, take a look at certain uh, states like uh, Alzheimer's disease, for example, where uh, increasingly, we're focusing upon uh, brain changes uh, in Alzheimer's patients that may be related to what is happening in, in the hippocampus. So again, another good example of basic research, behavioral neuroscience research that's helping us to understand uh, what is happening in terms of uh, a memory and uh, uh, memory deficits, memory problems. Um, Another uh, interesting uh, area of research in behavioral neuroscience, and again, I'm just offering some examples here of, of work that has been done in the field of behavioral neuroscience, which has led to uh, some an important understanding of um, uh, what is uh, uh, happening um, uh, in the brain uh, in certain types of behavior disorders. Uh, perhaps uh, in a introductory psychology course that you taught, uh, that you uh, took uh, at some point in your education, you talked about schizophrenia, which is the total shattering of uh, personality. It is the most extreme and that's certainly the worst form of behavior disorder that's very perplexing in which we have um, you know, struggled uh, in order to try to understand its etiology. Well, one hypothesis about what it may be related to has to do with this uh, hormone dopamine, uh, this neurotransmitter dopamine, it's simply called the dopamine hypothesis. And we're going to be learning um, about that hypothesis as we go along, but essentially um, uh, what this hypothesis says is that there are problems in the frontal area of the brain in terms of uh, excessive amounts of, uh, of dopamine. Uh, and that there's a, maybe an underlying genetic predisposition that is causing those changes to occur uh, in terms of um, uh, dopamine in the frontal part of the brain. So again, another interesting area of research uh, that has been done uh, in the field of uh, uh, behavioral neuroscience, which is uh, again, helping us understand this behavior disorder. Um, again, a psychotic behavior disorder that we refer to as schizophrenia. Um, another um, interesting area of research 
uh, has to do with, uh, in behavioral neuroscience, has to do with these synthetic substances that are called anabolic steroids. These are the synthetic variants of the natural hormone uh, testosterone that many individuals take in order to get bigger and stronger. And in the case of athletes, uh, helps them in terms of their uh, performance. And it's a worldwide problem now. Um, but one thing that uh, uh, behavioral neuroscientists are finding is that young people who take these, um, there are uh, uh, many reports now of uh, their, their health uh, being uh, harmed, uh, that um, there are behavioral changes that it can occur in terms of um, uh, something that's called roid rages, which are these very serious uh, mood changes and suicidal tendencies, for example, that can occur. Um, and um, it's a crisis uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, many young people uh, taking them. Certainly a lot of world-class athletes take them as well. Uh, it's something that we see throughout the world and, and uh, in a uh, athletes. Um, that individual that you see here, a uh, young man by the name of Brad Cunningham, who in his uh, early years uh, uh, started taking uh, these uh, anabolic steroids in order to get bigger and stronger. Uh, and what happened to him was that uh, after chronically taking these extremely high doses for a very long period of time, he had um, a, uh, a series, uh, he had a stroke and then a series of heart attacks. Um, and those are all um, uh, 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 potential um, uh, uh, outcomes uh, that can occur uh, in individuals who have uh, chronically taken, taken these. Uh, luckily, he, um, he survived uh, after being in the hospital for an extended period of time. And now here is that same individual. He's learning how to walk um, all over again. And again, this was a consequence of the strokes um, and the heart attacks that uh, that occurred um, in, in this individual. So again, this is another very active area of research um, uh, that it's helping us a great deal to understand uh, what happens uh, in individuals who uh, take these illicit drugs, uh, these anabolic steroids. So um, again, is behavioral neuroscience necessary? I, I think it absolutely is to help us to understand um, these, uh, this kind of a, an addiction uh, that occurs uh, in some individuals. Um, another area um, of research uh, has to do with, uh, in behavioral neuroscience, has to do with um, these brain changes that we know are occurring in individuals that have repeated concussions. Um, and what we're learning is that uh, if you take a look uh, at uh, uh, a normal brain, which you see on the left here, <clears throat> and the brain of an individual who um, uh, played the sport of football uh, in which uh, he had repeated concussions, um, you can see these uh, black, uh, brownish black spots um, that you see uh, right here. Um, and again, these are called protein tangles. Um, and you see them in individuals with concussions. You also see them in individuals um, who uh, suffer from Alzheimer's disease. So this is uh, very interesting that you're getting these degenerative kinds of changes, both in individuals who have concussions, frequent concussions, uh, as well as individuals uh, who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So again, this is along the lines of this uh, uh, discussion of, you know, is behavioral neuroscience necessary? And um, absolutely, uh, it's helping us to understand important um, uh, uh, disorders, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, being one that has reached epidemic proportions um, uh, throughout the world. Uh, and it's behavioral neuroscientists who are really on the front lines of doing research uh, in this area. Uh, here's another interesting piece of research uh, relatively uh, recently. Um, uh, work that's being done in terms of examining what happens in terms of the emotional tears that are produced in women 
um, that occur, you know, around the time of menstruation when a woman is much more likely uh, to cry. And uh, those tears, if we were to collect those tears in a small tube that you see here from a woman and then place them um, on this uh, uh, a pad of um, uh, a cotton uh, just under the nose of a male, uh, what it does is it changes the male's level of sexual arousal. It changes, it lowers their testosterone levels. Um, you get changes in terms of skin responses, in terms of electrical uh, skin responses. You get changes that are occurring in the brain. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the whole area of pheromones uh, as we go along. And uh, uh, those uh, those pheromonal substances, which in this case are perhaps are as a consequence of those tears. Um, once that's uh, uh, detected and smelled by a male, it may give a very important signal. And that signal is that it's really not the best time uh, to be engaging in sexual activity with a, with a, uh, with a female uh, at that period of time, that it's, uh, you know, not a really a period of time that's conducive uh, uh, to sexual behavior, and indeed it, it should be avoided. Um, so uh, again, this is a, you know, a very interesting piece of research um, in the field of uh, behavioral neuroscience. Um, here's another interesting piece of research. A lot of uh, work in behavioral neuroscience involves twins. Uh, research on identical twins and fraternal twins. And you can see uh, here are some identical twins uh, that you see right here. Um, <clears throat> you know, we study identical twins and compare them with fraternal twins because um, uh, identical twins, of course, are genetically identical to one another. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, um, do share some genes, but not anywhere near as many as identical twins do. So if a particular trait, a behavioral trait, for example, is one that um, uh, appears to be under genetic control, then you would expect a higher degree of relatedness in terms of their behavioral characteristics, what we call a concordance. Uh, we'll be getting into that uh, when we get into the whole area of genes and behavior. But one of the real, another interesting part of this is um, a new field that has emerged, which is called epigenetics, in which we try to understand identical twins in terms of differences uh, that you see uh, between identical twins. Um, and it's those differences that uh, may be due to these very small kinds of changes that are occurring, perhaps related to the environment, um, that are exerting an impact to a point where um, identical twins, you know, do show these very interesting differences in certain types of behavioral traits. And so this is called epigenetics. And it's a brand new field. And it's one that uh, is really helping us a great deal to understand um, behavior and the biology of behavior. So what are my goals for you as students? Well, clearly, I want to get across to you that behavioral neuroscience is a is a field that's important. It's a field that's helping us to answer questions um, that are allowing us to uh, allowing us to uh, understand human behavior and to understand um, uh, how we can uh, try to improve um, uh, human behavior or solve problems in terms of human behavior in the area of behavior disorders, for example. Um, so, um, again, I have some goals for you as students that I think are, is, are important to, to talk about, at least briefly. You know, first of all, I want you to start to think like a biopsychologist, uh, like a behavioral neuroscientist. And what that means is that you really have to incorporate a number of different viewpoints uh, about what our behavior um, is, is a product of. And I'll be going over that um, in our next lecture. Uh, I want you to understand the clinical impl implications of, of work in this area, and there are many clinical implications. I also want you to understand that um, it's important to be able to appreciate all of this from an evolutionary perspective. 
Um, and uh, that is, again, one of these really important viewpoints that has emerged over the last 20 or 30 years in the field of behavioral neuroscience, uh, this evolutionary perspective. And again, that's something we'll be taking a look at as we go along. And um, the, the relatively new field of cognitive neuroscience, which has really taken off in the last 10 or 15 years, I want you to understand uh, the research that is that is going on in that in that particular field and lastly uh, i want you to be able to think critically um, uh, understanding experiments you know as we go along what is certainly a great deal of experimental work that's going on in the field of behavioral neuroscience that's you know absolutely crucial but 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 some science is better than others uh, and in some cases, um, you know, we, we can make, you know, really good conclusions about uh, the biology of behavior, but in other cases, you know, we really can't. And, you know, with each new set of experiments that comes along, um, yes, we're able to answer questions, but oftentimes it leads to many more questions. So um, uh, I think you know, these are my, my goals for you. And I, and I hope that as we go along, um, that we'll be able to, um, uh, that by the end of this course, you will be able to, to more fully understand and appreciate uh, the biological basis of, of behavior. A um, couple of good websites that I want you to take a look at and, and constantly refer to uh, over the course uh, of the material that I'll, I'll be presenting. Um, one is uh, the Dana Foundation, www.dana.org. Um, this is a foundation which has been involved for many years now in terms of um, coordinating information about brain research. Um, and what that website does is, uh, and what that organization does, that foundation does, is uh, it, it serves as a collecting point for uh, scientists to learn about recent research that's going on. Um, it, it has a number of different educational programs that regularly reports uh, to uh, both the layperson as well as scientists about um, uh, new research that's coming um, all the time. And so I want you to get familiar with it. And I want you to go uh, onto this website, again, Dana.org, right? And uh, it's for the Dana Foundation. And I want you to take a look at it and, and examine uh, all the different important things that are on there. So again, spend some time on that uh, over the next uh, few days uh, to, to get used to it um, and to, to see what it, what it offers. Another uh, very important organization is one that's called sfn.org. Uh, uh, sfn.org, this is uh, the major uh, professional uh, society for those working uh, in the area of neuroscience. And certainly people that are involved with behavior and neuroscience, sfn.org, uh, the Society for Neuroscience. And again, it's a principal professional organization for those that are involved um, in uh, uh, the neuroscience uh, field, again, all over the world. And um, again, there's a lot of um, important information there. Uh, summarizing um, research articles uh, for the layperson, um, talking about the latest scientific research that's being done. Um, so again, take a look at it. Um, go to sfn.org and learn a little bit about what, uh, what goes on with that uh, professional uh, organization. Um, the growth of this field has been spectacular, and I want you to get a feel for it. 1971 is really when it got its start. Uh, it's a number of years ago uh, now, about 50 years ago. Um, at the time that it started, there were only 200 members, uh, and they were mostly you know, from the United States. If you take a look at the discipline of behavioral neuroscience today, uh, it is very different. 2018, there was about 40,000 members worldwide. And here, uh, what you see here is a meeting, uh, an international meeting of uh, sfn.org. 
Society for Neuroscience, and um, it literally takes over an entire city, uh, the yearly meeting. And there's an awful lot of really good um, uh, work that goes on in terms of the reporting of science, uh, as well as uh, the gathering of uh, researchers um, uh, that are working in similar areas so that they can share information. And uh, so, so it's really taken off. Um, and um, it, is a, it is a very, very important field um, of, of research uh, today, the field of neuroscience. But again, not all that old, you know, 50 years ago is when it got its start, but more and more people have become involved uh, in the brain sciences and in the field of neuroscience and behavioral neuroscience. Uh, here's some top journals, um, just a few of them. There's probably over a thousand um, journals uh, specifically devoted to reporting on uh, the brain sciences, behavioral neuroscience. And uh, this is just a, a, a short list of some of the more prominent ones, but there's two that are more important than others. One is science and the other is nature. Uh, so if you see things reported in there, uh, I mean, they have rejection rates, uh, maybe one out of every one or two out of every 100 articles that are submitted there ultimately are, are accepted. Um, it tends to be work that gets highly cited uh, by other scientists. And, and again, this is many you know scientists would say that uh, you know their career has been made by by publishing in in one of these uh publishing an article in one of these uh journals science or nature and again all these journals are very good but these two really stand out as being more prominent than others so again just a feel for you know um, uh, what the uh, the profession looks like in terms of uh, some of the journals that that scientists publish their work in. Um, so, lastly, you know, let's just take a look at the broad field of behavioral neuroscience in terms of the jobs that are out there, and you can really divide it up into four areas: what I call research fields, practitioner fields, medical fields, and allied medical fields. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of a feel. Okay, let's take a look at these fields of specialization. Um, and again, let's first take a look at, at research fields. Uh, and these are individuals who um, have uh, uh, received, um, uh, gone on to advanced training, received doctoral degrees in a variety of different fields. They work in universities, private, uh, institutes, research inst institutes, pharmaceutical companies, they work in hospitals. And, and again, take a look um, at the, the, uh, the, the titles, uh, the research fields of these individuals. We have neuroscientists, we have um, behavioral uh, uh, neuroscientists, uh, we have cognitive neuroscientists, uh, we have neuropsychologists, we have psychophysiologists, neurochemists, comparative psychologists, evolutionary psychologists. I mean, you could take a look at, um, you know, what these individuals do. Um, uh, many of them are obviously involved in, in, in research. Uh, and it really requires, you know, uh, uh, advanced training uh, in the field of, uh, of neuroscience, uh, field of neuroscience, and, and in particular in the field of behavioral neuroscience. So if you take a look at a neuroscientist, um, as you see here uh, on the very top, um, they study anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, the nervous system. Uh, again, they're very strong requirement of a neuroscience background. Uh, behavioral neuroscientists, they're investigating the functioning of the brain, uh, functioning of uh, relationship between brain and behavior. Uh, cognitive neuroscience, um, you're studying uh, the thought process, you're studying um, uh, uh, thinking, problem solving, and the various biological changes that are occurring in the brain during those very important uh, behavioral activities. Neuropsychologists are on the front lines really of, of trying to help people with uh, some kind of brain damage or people with disabilities. Um, and again, background in neuroscience is crucial. 
uh, psychophysiologists um, uh, interested in basic uh, biological functioning like uh, breathing and brain waves and heart rate and so on and how that's related to, uh, to behavior. Neurochemists are interested in what is happening in terms of neurotransmitters and other chemicals within the brain and its relationship to behavior. A comparative psychologist and evolutionary psychologists want to understand from the perspective of uh, looking at many different uh, species uh, relationship between um, uh, brain and behavior and how various uh, selective pressures um, have really produced uh, behavioral change. Uh, so again, th this is what we call um, um, uh, what we call research fields. All really require a very significant background uh, in the field uh, of of neuroscience. So uh, lastly, we have this uh, you know practitioner fields uh, of psychology. Uh, clinical psychology, counseling psychology, school psychologists, you know, these require an advanced degree, a doctoral degree. Um, their work, even though it's not directly related to neuroscience, it's really important that they do have a background uh, in the field of neuroscience. Um, uh, and again, this is becoming increasingly important as we learn more about uh, the biological basis of behavior. Uh, and then we have medical fields. Um, again, this requires uh, an MD degree, um, a lot of additional training, uh, obviously, uh, in, a, in a specialization. Uh, these are individuals, uh, obviously, some, many of them are in private practice, but it's uh, important to have a background uh, in the field of, of neuroscience. Uh, if you're a neurologist, if you're a neurosurgeon, if you're a psychiatrist, that, that becomes, you know, crucial uh, in, in the, uh, the practice um, of, uh, of those uh, particular professions. Um, and, and lastly, what we call allied medical fields, um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, uh, they require um, uh, a master's degree and in, in the United States now, uh, a doctoral degree uh, is required for physical therapy, for example. Um, they're employed in a lot of different uh, settings, uh, but some knowledge of the field of behavioral neuroscience is really crucial. Uh, so, um, I, I, again, the, there's a lot of opportunities that are out there for people who have been trained in the field of neuroscience. Uh, and who have had uh, specifically training in, in the area of behavioral neuroscience. So it's becoming more and more uh, essential. So, um, you know, is behavioral neuroscience necessary? Yes, um, it is. And again, this, the last few slides, we've just taken a look at, uh, at uh, these various fields um, uh, that require, these professions that require background in the field of neuroscience. Uh, so that kind of wraps up our uh, uh, this particular lecture. Um, we're going to be uh, moving on, uh, but uh, again, please do take a look at those uh, two websites, sfn.org and dana.org. Um, they're very important in the field of behavioral um, neuroscience.